My name is Jonathan Henderson. I'm Intertel's Chief Analytics Officer. I was probably chosen to give this talk because I won last year's hackathon. My background's in data analytics and finance, having come from roles in private equity, upstream oil and gas, and risk management consulting. I've gone ahead and put mine and my company's contact information at the bottom of the slide if anybody wants to reach out after the presentation. A little bit about my company. So my co-founder spent 13 years in the CIA and coupled with my background in data analytics, we understand how data can help shape decision-making. We leverage Spotfire quite heavily to help pull workflows out of traditional software and at worst spreadsheets to improve efficiency and gain insights. Our software is used by clients across the value energy chain and value chain and energy from ENPs all the way up to hedge funds. Our main products include pre-built Spotfire solutions and unique data sets. We also consult across a variety of industries to help companies achieve their digital transformations. In this presentation, I'm going to be sharing my winning approach to Spotfire, focusing on mods, data functions, geoanalytics, R, and Python, and how we can extend these in your data analytics to help be successful and hopefully win this year's hackathon. And analytics is not just about the numbers. Aesthetics also play a crucial role in the success of your Spotfire workflow. So we're going to be talking about design principles and some of the key components of design principles and how to make your analytics stand out. So first principles of high impact visual analytics. If you saw the keynote from Jan William Tolp, he shared a lot of great insights in the keynote. In this session, we're actually going to deep dive in some of the pragmatic approaches that we can use right now. Firstly, we're going to talk about what to do rather than what not to do. But don't worry, we're going to end up covering both. At the high level, we're going to be talking specifically about color, typography, and then the broader user experience and user interface and how these elements combine to have high impact visual analytics. One of my favorite phrases is, ugly homes don't have busy open houses. The same applies to your analytics and dashboards. And users perceive that more appealing designs, visually speaking, are easier to use. And the reverse also holds true. So a poor user experience can ruin an otherwise great design. User interface and user experience are definitely a balancing act. The first topic of interest is color. So our brains are better at identifying color rather than shapes. And this is most evident if you look at the graphics on the right-hand side of the slide. If you try to discern how many squares are within that top image, it's hard to discern. If you look at the bottom, we can see that it's pretty easy to see that there's four. So providing color to, con to add contrast to your visual analytics helps guide the, the user into getting the analytics that they want out of a specific visualization and gain insight from the data. So similar to how oxygen is essential for human life, proper and consistent use of color is essential for high impact visual analytics. Color is the largest visual impact component of a user interface. And for me, the biggest issue with color is using it consistently. And consistent doesn't just correspond with the same colors on every page, but consistency of meaning. For example, you wouldn't want to use stop signs in your design and then color them green because that's what would be consistent with the theme of your dashboard. Consistency of color should adhere to best practices in your industry, or at least shouldn't violate what is common knowledge for your users. So for an example, in oil and gas, we color oil production as green and gas production as red. So not adhering to these best practices, so if I colored everything blue, might lead to confusion, even though it might clash with the aesthetics of my overall dashboard. With respect to Spotfire, using document color schemes can help with consistency across your visualizations, as you can easily apply a color scheme to a new visualization and then match additional visualizations with a predefined color scheme. So any takeaway that you get from this is that colors should be consistent, but also adhere to existing guidelines where available. Typography. So typography affects readability, professionalism, semantics, uh, and overall design aesthetics. But typography is more than choosing a nice font. It also encompasses white space, hierarchy, paragraph, letter spacing, among other components all of which have a large impact on readability and visual impact for users, but also the meaning behind some of the typography. So if we look at the graphic on the bottom left, we'll see, I always love you. The same words are down below, but the difference between that top and the bottom might be a restraining order. So choosing the right font can have a huge impact on how users interact and perceive what you're trying to, do, what you're trying to show. On the right-hand side, we can see that typography can also be used to design hierarchy within your structure. So we can see headings and then subheadings and then smaller subheadings. So this helps direct your user's eyes down to what we want them to see within a visualization. 
for user experience and user interface, we're just gonna keep at this high level. But before I jump in, you'll see that the, the visual on the right-hand side, it's actually from a Reddit contest from several years back, where as a joke, people developed the worst user experience they can possibly think of for volume controls. Needless to say, you do not want anything looking like this in your, in your visualizations. With respect to Spotfire, when creating filters and text areas, check the default filter option for the data as the defaults aren't always sensible. So providing a checkbox filter when there's hundreds or thousands of options needs to be changed to a list box if categorical or a radial slider if numeric. And user experience without user interface is like a brain without a body. User interface without user experience is like a body without a brain. So user experience, UX, design will always put users' needs first when considering design solutions in order to enhance user satisfaction. Whereas user interface should help make products joyful to interact with, focusing on visual hierarchy and patterns that are giving cues to your users on how to use your analytics. So I wanted to talk about this. This is the Cleveland McGill Scale of Perceptibility. It was a study from the 1980s on human cognitive abilities and how we interpret data as humans accurately through a variety of charting methods. So the Cleveland McGill research on graphical perception highlighted the importance of accurately conveying data through visuals representations. They found that certain visual cues like position along a common scale are more accurately and quickly perceived by viewers than others such as angle or area, which is partly why data visualization experts are not a big fan of pie charts. So when designing dashboards, it's critical to prioritize these effective cues to ensure users can understand data at a glance. Clear labeling, appropriate scaling, minimizing clutter also play a significant role in creating user-friendly dashboards that facilitate better comprehension and decision-making. When we're encoding all these different types of visualizations, we can see color, saturation, volume, area, angle, length, and position. The most important one, or at least the strongest factor for understanding data is position, and then size, and then shape. Color and shading actually proved to be the least effective for, for performing cognitive tasks. However, color and the saturation intensity have an immense impact on directing focus. So use these when you're trying to create your visualizations to help guide your users and help analyze the underlying data. So the next topic I wanted to talk about is best practices. So what to do? So we talked about high-level design principles through typography, color, user interface, and experience, but it's important to do a deeper dive on best practices for individual visualizations to comprise your analytics. So at a high level, let's keep the focus point to one element, one theme, one message, what's clearly understood. Within the hackathon, it's pretty straightforward as you already have an objective, the goals, the questions we're trying to answer. With your data, it might take some some introspective look at what your data entails, if it's, especially if it's a new data set. So understand the data before you try and present it. Each visualization should also showcase just one element. Each visualization should also reinforce the overall narrative of the dashboard. So everything should work towards one end goal. And visualizations should be tailored to the audience and have enough context applied. So providing titles, scales, legends, colors, descriptions, things like that will all help ensure your audience understands the message. And going back to the Cleveland McGill study, we can use position, patterns, and contrast and color to help convey that story more effectively. And then just as we talked about things to do, we're gonna talk about the pitfalls of bad design and things to avoid. First thing is overcomplicating the design. And I'm using on the top right hand image, a, a picture of a Power BI dashboard, which is a good example of a complicated design. It's trying to do too much, show too much on one dashboard. So conveying too many concepts in a single visual is complicating. So if you look at the bottom hand image, we can see a stacked bar chart, multiple colors, multiple axes are being used. There's a title, there's also a text call out. There's just too much going on in that visual. So too many types of information in one visualization is information overload for users. So it's something you want to avoid. The next big pitfall is misrepresenting the data. So cutting off axes at certain levels, especially if you're using multiple axes, having different values or, or trying to cut off one of the values to show something at a higher or lower value than what it really should be represented as. A general rule of thumb is that your numeric axes should always start at zero unless you're working with log or negative values. It should be at least consistent across the visuals. So don't misrepresent the data or at least have consistency across your y-axis or x-axis for each one of those visualizations where you can. 
Another big pitfall is not providing context or explanation. So don't deep dive into something that requires subject matter expertise or not knowing your audience's familiarity with the subject. Similar to how books are structured with chapters, storytelling your data through the use of visual should be conveyed in a similar manner. It should be structured in a very thought out process. And then lastly, don't use the wrong visualization. Choosing the right chart depends on the data and it depends on if you're looking to present a distribution, a relationship, composition, or a comparison of your data. Remember that areas and angles are harder for humans to perceive and compare against. So if your goal is to show a comparison, using a bar or a line chart rather than a pie chart would generally be best practices. So we've talked about a lot of what to do, what not to do. Now we're gonna explain how we can extend Spotfire uh, starting out with Spotfire mods to really enhance your visual analytics. So Spotfire mods, they enable almost unlimited customizations and an expansion of your analytics and visualization capabilities beyond what comes out of the box with Spotfire. One of my favorite visualizations is the ridgeline plot, which is shown here on the right. And it's also known as a joy plot, which is uh, named after the cover image of Joy Division's album, Unknown Pleasures, which is probably dating me a little bit. Uh, but if you've ever seen these, they're great for showing distributions of a numeric value across several groups of categorical data. So it's drawing a density curve across each one of these subsets of your, of your categorical data. So they're very, very powerful understanding how distributions can change, how they can change through time, how they can change across different categories. Um, so this is one naturally one of the first mods that I wanted to create. So this is a mod we've created internally, uh, and it's the ridgeline plot. And of course, also with this mod, I wanted to incorporate my favorite color palette, which is Viridis, which has equal color intensity across the color spectrum. And it's great for increasing accessibility for your users because it's colorblind friendly which is another thing you also probably want to consider when creating these visualizations. But Spotfire mods are very, very expansive. There's over 30 plus available on Spotfire Community Exchange. So if you haven't taken a look at that, please feel free to visit the links that I provided in the footers below, as they most of the time will link to either a GitHub library or an existing description or explanation for one of these visuals. Another Spotfire mod I wanted to call out, and one of the benefits of working with Spotfire mods is it works with just about any JavaScript library. So because you can utilize any JavaScript component or component libraries, it's giving you a series of options to expand your mods well beyond what you're allowed to do or what you can do within your typical visualization properties. So if you ever right-clicked on a visualization, gone through the properties, or looked at you know, any of the components where you can customize some of the visualizations, it can be limited, especially for mods. So adding something like a React component or a JavaScript library called React, it can give you the ability to customize any of your mod visualizations in any way you can possibly imagine. So the visualization on the right-hand side is our dash card mod, which is something we've developed internally. And it's one of the visualizations that I thought many other dashboarding tools that had, uh, you know, where, where the KPI visualization might not just cut it, at least aesthetically, in my opinion. So we ended up building this and then adding in React library components to help provide users with tons of customizations. So everything from the label fonts to the minor label fonts to time settings, sparkline colors, whether we wanted to use a solid color or a gradient color, all these options are presented and this is possible through the React library. So actually, Spotfire has React libraries available within the mods GitHub page. So I provided a link to the GitHub uh, repo where React demo properties are available. So you can actually build something similar to what we're displaying here and create dash cards on your own. So take a look at the library. And if you haven't gone through the GitHub, it's definitely worth checking out. There are a variety of other options and, and examples uh, for visuals that aren't yet into uh, the Spotfire library. But one thing to take away from this is that JavaScript provides almost endless customizations, and you can find generally any kind of visualization and an example that already exists that's easy to bring into Spotfire in a unique and customized way. Another thing I wanted to point out with Spotfire mods is not only are you being provided a unique and unconventional way to visualize data outside of the box or outside of the, the core functions and visualizations that are included within Spotfire, but you can also display data beyond the original intention. So if we look at the right visualization, we have drought level selection. And I've kind of highlighted this here, and what we're actually visualizing is not a legend for the map, but I'm using a Kanban mod 
Uh, and it's one I've used in, in the last year's hackathon for showing users a legend. So it's serving a dual purpose, but it's also markable. So I can then select any specific drought area and it will showcase on the map just through markings, or we can show all the drought levels simultaneously through no markings. So the neat thing about the Kanban mod is that it's also forcing users to select just one drought level at a time. So it's enabling users to drill down and funneling the user selections within a specific drought level at a time. So it's really, really useful as well, you know, just beyond creating a new visualization, but also figuring out new ways you can force users to use your, your visualizations or kind of funnel them down a path to help encourage additional drill down and insights. Pie charts are generally a, a Poor visualization option, because if you remember back to the Cleveland McGill study, humans are not very good at comparing area and angles, both of which a pie chart requires users to do. However, sunburst charts, which I've shown on the left-hand side, have the same visual appeal, but solve many of pie charts' problems through interactivity and breaking down subcomponents of the larger pie. So in the last half hackathon, these were used to interrogate data by encouraging users to drill down on the subsets of data. Sunburst charts, which are you know similar to tree maps in terms of use, allow interactive and markable ways to break down hierarchies within your data while providing the visual appeal of a area chart or a donut chart. So we've talked about mods. Now I wanna talk about geospatial data uh, since it's at the core of this year's hackathon. So understanding how to leverage Spotfire's existing data functions and mods on the Spotfire exchange could be the difference in you making an outstanding entry within the timeframe as these can all save you some time. So first up is the parameterization of data functions. So for all these examples that I'm going to be showcasing on this slide and the next slide, we're actually using the spatial heat map data function from Spotfire's exchange. So what we have on the left-hand side is a text area, and we have that text area containing four document properties. The nice thing about Spotfire that no other business intelligence tool allows is the parameterization of scripting, whether it's R or Python, to be able to pass document properties into a script to dynamically call scripting properties. So we can pass these four document properties to a modified Spotfire data function that's available on the exchange for you to experiment on your own to dynamically control the behavior of the script. Another neat thing, if you look at the second document property on the left-hand side, the visualization color scheme, and what's being visualized on the right-hand side, is I'm actually visualizing and coloring the map as well as the QQ plot and the CDF plot through a chosen color scheme. So when I choose Veritas or I choose another one of the color schemes, such as Turbo, which is the very bottom image, I'm actually changing the color scheme of property that's being applied to each one of these visualizations through some Iron Python. So it's a really, really powerful way to add additional parameterization to the outputs of your data functions. And then deep diving into the actual data function that's on the exchange, we can go and look at how the variable that we've selected is then passed dynamically to the columns. So I'm looking at the scripting, the edit parameters on the script, and the Z variable, which we're calling, is actually a dynamically calculated expression. So I choose the data table of interest, and then I'm adding a dot escape, which is adding brackets to the dynamically named column, and then the geo variable, which is essentially just the column selection that a user chooses. And so this is passed dynamically to the data function. And then the other parameters such as grid resolution and smoothing are within the script itself. So if you notice the geo variables called directly within the parameter expression, and then the remaining document properties are added as inputs within the data function script. So this is how we're parameterizing an existing data function to make it a little bit more user-friendly and allow users to really fine tune what they wanna get out of these data functions. So this is a really, really powerful way to help add additional features to an existing data function that might be on the exchange. Some additional quick tips on the document property selection. So if you're working with data sets that have hundreds or thousands of columns, if you provide users to choose all available columns within a specific data table, they might be left with a list of hundreds and hundreds of columns. So we can actually distill this down to columns of interest or column types that match the document property that we're trying to convey. So whether you're working with uh, integers or real data types, or you wanted to call a specific column by name, if you actually look in the expression where we're, we have selectable columns and you can limit it this, this through an expression, I just found out about this feature myself. And it's one that I only really recently realized and have been leveraging 
but we can type in data type real or data type int. And this will limit the available columns that have matching data types. And then I can say other things like and not or and, and then call out specific column names. So if I want something to have, you know, if I'm looking at ladder length and I have a variety of columns that have ladder length in the name, I can call out each one of those and add asterisks at the beginning or end to Boolean, you know, to add to a Boolean expression to bring in multiple data columns that are matching that, that ex specific expression. One thing to keep in mind is that if the expression yields no matching columns, the dropdown will become unresponsive and that can likely lead to some confusion. So just make sure that the expression will always be matched by some data type within your data table. But this is a great method for quick limiting of available columns rather than having to go through the select columns option and then going through and creating a new column properties where I'm you know, manually going through the list of hundreds and hundreds of variables. It's a real fast and easy and efficient way to do this and one that'll probably come in handy in the hackathon. Another way we've actually extended Spotfire is through Iron Python. So we can call a REST API directly. So one of our clients has restrictions on Python and R packages, and their IT groups actually blocked PyPy. So utilizing Python libraries can sometimes cause issues. So actually, one of the things we did was we're calling chat GPT from within Iron Python. So we're directly calling the API from Iron Python scripting, where we can ask a question and it will return the response. And then if we wanted to further ask questions, it will then chain the responses together. So you can have a conversation within Spotfire similar to how you would have a conversation with ChatGPT on the web interface. And the nice thing about this, and this gets into user interface, but we also use regex to strip out any code examples. So if I'm asking this to write a Spotfire expression for me, the regex will strip out the code examples provided by ChatGPT and provide it into a code snippets dialog so I can easily copy and paste, which you can see here. But in Intertel, we leverage Iron Python quite heavily. And for those of you that are aware, multiple data functions can't write to the same output table. However, Iron Python is able to get around this by calling data functions programmatically and reading the results of the functions into a single output. We can also run multiple data functions from the cloud so that updating a script in our repo is automatically pushed to our Spotfire workflows without having to update the underlying Spotfire data functions. So, and as of Spotfire 12, if you have dozens and dozens of Iron Python scripts, you can leverage the powerful script management API to help automate the management of Iron Python and JavaScript implementations within your Spotfire documents. And I provided a link to the community article where the script manager is described in better detail than I can do in this presentation. Another way to extend Spotfire is through GeoAnalytics. So extending Spotfire with Python, and we can leverage SciPy, Shapely, and SKLearn to provide geospatial capabilities that are unmatched in the business intelligence space. We leverage Python quite a bit to help draw synthetic wellbore diagrams from a handful of public data points, including an implied helocation. What this does is this gets us a synthetic three-point survey from service hole, bottom hole, true vertical depth. Those synthetic surveys are then converted into well-known binary outputs for displaying as feature layers within Spotfire. And from there, we can use markings from that feature layer to decide which well pads compute gun barrel diagrams on. So Spotfire not only enables the creation of geospatial line geometries from tabular data, but those geometries then can then be interacted with uh, for users to further drill down and gain additional insights on well spacing. And the gun barrel diagram allows users to develop and look at the gun barrel diagrams to see pairwise well spacing across interval and across wells in an area of interest. And because Spotfire comes embedded with its own Python interpreter, users don't need to fuss with installing local versions of Python and the nightmares from having to do package management across potentially hundreds of users in an organization. And also when considering that Spotfire administrators can deploy SPKs to bundle and deploy specific Python packages, it almost becomes easier to write and use Python within a Spotfire environment than it does from a traditional IDE. Another GeoAnalytics extension is showing how we can take other Python libraries, such as GeoPandas and Shapely, to allow the manipulation of geospatial data in ways that just aren't possible in other tools, and provide non-technical users the ability to intuitively interrogate and interact with a Python and R script that they otherwise couldn't write themselves. So one of the key issues right now in oil and gas is remaining inventory. And to calculate remaining inventory, users are usually stuck with manually sticking up an area, a given area of interest, whether that's DSUs or a basin. And that process can take hundreds and hundreds of hours. So we're actually leveraging geospatial scripting libraries in Python to solve these problems that would other take, otherwise take hundreds of hours to do. 
One such example is remaining inventory calculation. So we can actually take the spot fire and providing a user interface so users can go and, and show to, uh, selectively on document properties, figuring out which intervals they want to, to provide spacing assumptions for. And we're hiding or showing document properties with a little bit of JavaScript to selectively display or hide those HTML elements. And then those will show up and then you can input your assumptions. And then we're using the Python libraries to compute uh, remaining inventory in a given basin and show that within a geospatial interface. So these all get populated. And then there's also pre-built scripts within Spotfire's library where we can actually export these as any shape files. So if you wanted to do the first stab of workflow within Spotfire and then export to another GIS tool, you have the ability to do so. Another way we've extended geoanalytics within Spotfire is using R. So there's libraries such as SF, SP, LWGeom, RGeos, RGDAL. Each one of these analytics libraries help get more data, more use out of the data, but also gain insights into some of the geospatial data. But because we have tabular data that we're constantly working with, as well as geospatial data, we can help bridge the gap between disparate data sets. So we can use points and polygons or polygon intersections to help find relationships between multiple data sets. So in the example images here, we have before where we're just looking at tracked data for an existing user. Well, that user can now input using some geospatial functions, a certain distance around their track tracks to find a larger boundary to search for rigs, permits, and other activity around them. So beyond just points and polygons for an existing shapefile, we can create an expanded shapefile to then create relationships between disparate data sets. So Spotfire's powerful geospatial capabilities and the large repository of pre-built data functions available in the community offers a, a substantial head start when comparing the pros and cons of different business intelligence tools. Spotfire is a clear winner as these capabilities just aren't offered in any other tool. I know we've covered a lot, so thank you, and please, let's connect.